Thank you very much for the invitation and for all the practical help. It's a real honour to be back here in AUB. The nub of my argument today is that critiques of neoliberal urbanism have recently converged with the policy-oriented literature on informality to condemn property titling, that is, the provision of property titles for those living in informal settlements. My argument is that these critiques overlook what residents themselves have to say, and that in doing so, they reproduce the values that they themselves criticise. To illustrate, first of all, from urban policy. As Jeff Payne et al. said a few years ago, categorically, titling programmes should now be discouraged in favour of other options. And this, I think, now represents the dominant orthodox view within progressive policy-oriented circles. From a more theoretical perspective, to take this as one example, um, Abdul Malik Simon and Julianne Boudreau write about um, or, or, or draw attention to the importance of mobilities, migration, immigration, resisting colonial emplacement, yearning for a home, and on the other hand, the crushing weight of state domination, efforts to regularize, normalize, settle down, erase the past and entrench spatial hierarchies. And I see in that regularization and normalization an indirect reference to policies such as programming, or not so indirect necessarily. What's the problem, um, basically, in the context of the policy literature? There are a number, but the key one can be summarised in the word gentrification or market-driven displacement. So Smok and Laranjera talking about freehold titles facilitating the disposal of individual properties and weakening community cohesiveness and collective action. Payne et al. point out that this doesn't just apply to owners, that it also applies to tenants. Both tenants and newly titled owners are vulnerable given the attraction of the suddenly enhanced value of their asset through titling to higher income groups or others with the motives and abilities to take advantage. Raiding, in other words. Now, gentrification is an argument, market-driven displacement, which is cited over and over again with great insistence. I think more um, insistence than, I have to say, there are convincing empirical examples to um, back up the um, argument to titling in this context. In Latin America, um, one of the examples which has been in the news in fairly recent times is the favela Vigigal in Rio de Janeiro, which is um, becoming host of um, guest houses or eco hotels for tourists. But I think these two photographs both show the nature of gentry or show this particular um, aspect of gentrification and show why in my opinion, it's not a good idea to take the southern zone of Rio as a model for gentrification connected with um, titling or the upgrading of favelas. The photographs say it all, the view and the tourists taking their pictures of the view. This is not um, representative, essentially. A few years ago, a um, couple of years ago, I spent a day going around four areas of Mexico City that I'd first got to know when I did my PhD on this issue of titling in the early 1980s. I'm just going to show you some illustrations briefly from the two areas marked with a red cross. The first one in the south of the city, San Jerónimo Aculco, which is um, a prime candidate for gentrification, or should be, according to its location. It's um, next to one of the most prestigious, famous um, areas of uh, residential areas in Mexico City, next to um, one of the main roads in the city in an area of very high uh, environmental values and near prestigious um, universities and higher education institutions. So if anywhere is going to gentrify, this area would. The next slide shows a couple of 
uh, houses, which we might prima facie take as evidence for gentrification occurring in this area. These are ones I took a couple of years ago. But it's important to point out that they are um, integrated or cheek by jowl with very, very different types of housing, as you can see in this slide from exactly the same area. And in fact, this area has always been a mixed area. These are my photos from the early 1980s. Um, I always like the bottom slide because it allows me to illustrate the English style of informality and then, if you can see the green roofs, the French style of informality. But it's always been a mixed area. The point is, it's still a mixed area. Sweeping generalisation has not happened. Contrast this for interest with an area that was more homogeneously um, working class in the early 1980s, an area called San Agustin, um, the illustrations there. These are the pictures from the early 1980s, and these are the pictures of the same area today. Um, it's more dense, it's grown upwards, but other than that, it's not that different. I revisited two of the other areas. I worked in six areas in the early 1980s. In the early 1990s, I revisited a number of them. And I did a survey between 70 and 80 households in each of these two areas. Um, and here are histograms showing the year of arrival of the people who I randomly interviewed at that time. The top slide might on the face of it show evidence of gentrification. The year of expropriation for um, titling, although titling doesn't necessarily follow immediately, but in the next couple of years, was 1970 in this case. And you can see that most of the people in the area by 1991 had arrived after that. However, if you look at the bottom diagram where the expropriation year was 1976, most people had arrived before, um, uh, before um, expropriation, before the start of regularization. But the really striking thing is that these two histograms are virtually identical. <coughs> so they talk about processes of population going on really regardless of titling. So in short, I have my doubts about the gentrification argument. What there is, of course, to go back to San Agustin, is an expansion of rental housing over the years. Um, to ask why such areas change, I don't have time to uh, linger on this point, but I would like to um, point to the idea that these are in a progressively better location, relatively speaking, as the city expands. And in my view, the kinds of changes recorded in somewhere like San Agustin are not gentrification, or if they are a kind of gentrification. It's a kind of gentrification to which other areas are equally subject, whether or not they were originally informal and whether or not they've been titled. Speaking, however, of... Sorry. Speaking of renting, one of the women um, I interviewed in a, a study in the late 1990s in Guadalajara, Mexico's second city, had this to say about titling. I can't rent my house out to anyone because they'll take it off me. If I'm not there, anyone can take it off me. And she's not inventing here. When I did my work in the early 1980s, I found in official agencies thousands of complaints in files and folders, a significant number of, of which referred to precisely this kind of problem, that some official agency had been around, the owner was either um, absent on a family visit or absent for other purposes, and the people living there as tenants or whatever had claimed that the property was theirs. So if I'm not there, as she rightly knows, anyone can take it off me. But if I've already got a title, let's see if they can take it off me. In other words, I've got something to defend myself with. So what I'm suggesting is that whereas titling is often said to be a bad thing for tenants, it may be the case that it actually expands the offer of rental housing on that kind of logic. And in Guadalajara in those years, um, we spoke to nearly 200 um, women um, owners in um, two informal areas, or originally informal areas. And you can see that their views of titling were um, fairly unanimously positive. The only exceptions, 1.8% um, who talked about the cost or the issue of taxes, or who didn't like it for some other reason. Most people were very clearly in favor, primarily because titling was seen to offer security or peace of mind. It gives you a chance to prove ownership. 
They're not interested in rushing out there to exchange their homes for ready cash. The increase of value is not something that was talked about by a lot of people, although they do want to be able to sell or rent if they need to do so, and so on. But if we go back to the critic criticisms from um, policy in particular, we see that the core problem, what really worries people, is exclusion. Rightly or wrongly, they think that titling leads to exclusion of the um, original um, po population. And in this, to change gear slightly, they um, echo discussions in the literature about the nature of property. So, for example, Margaret Davis's book, she mentions that, or argues that property is not just about our power over an object, it's fundamentally about our ability to exclude others from a resource. Now, I find these arguments about exclusion interesting in the way they connect back to what I said about mobilization at the start, or mobilities rather, not mobilization, mobilities at the start of this talk. And it's an argument I'm familiar with more in the context of um, criticisms or, or debates about uh, subjectivity and identity, but it's an argument which applies to property, to law, to knowledge. It's a critique of, if you like, the metaphysics of presence or the logic of identity, as Alonso puts it in Western thought, which the same or similar arguments apply in all these different contexts. So here, one quote from Davis, pointing out that the metaphor of the proper as that which is unified, coherent, distinct, autonomous, pure, and self-identical. In identity terms, it's a concern about the excluded, sorry, the exclusionary, bounded, coherent self. Knowledge, too, as Davis points out, is often analogized to real property as a bounded terrain. So it's about this idea of replacing bounded terrains, closure, legal closure, um, with, in, in, in identity terms, multiple and mobile subjectivities. The same argument is to be found in debates about home and the house, not referred to the tenure of the home, but just the idea of the home. As Mark Wheatley pointed out some time ago, the house is always first understood as the most primitive drawing of a line producing an inside opposed to an outside. In other words, the space of the self versus the space of the others. If you extend that argument about home to homeland, you can so see quite clearly the associations here with colonialism too and the colonial um, other as opposed to the imperial self. These ideas of property also apply to, or the proper in property apply to property in, in the self, with Davies pointing out that the concept of the self-contained, bounded, exclusionary individual um, supports and in its term is supported by dominant conceptions of property. And people I've spoken to in informal settlements that have been legalised in Guadalajara echo these ideas. So, for example, a beautiful quote from Anna Maria says that, for me, my title, it's my birth certificate. That's what my title is, because I'm somebody, because that's why I have my birth certificate. If I didn't have it, I'd be a nobody. So her whole um, self-identity being founded also on this idea of property, of property in the self, property in the home. Now, clearly, this concern about um, exclusion is um, a concern about um, binaries, the logic of identity, as um, Iris Marion Young explains in relation to Alonso's theorising, being that it creates binaries, that what, become, what was the merely different becomes the absolutely other. And the whole emphasis on mobility is precisely intended to combat these kinds of binaries. It's worth pointing out, though, that debates about titling are very much entrenching, it seems to me, um, binary thinking about this issue. For example, here in the, cousin, the um, title of an article by Ben Cousins from 2005, Titling versus Social Embeddedness. Um, and Pauline Peters has pointed out, in relation in particular to social embeddedness is generally equated with customary or indigenous tenure systems, and Paul D. Peters, both of these last quotes are referring in particular to um, Southern Africa. Um, Pauline Peters talks about a reactive literature having been come caught within the very formulation it sought to dislodge, celebrating indigenous or customary systems as flexible and adaptive, 
and thus reversing the hegemonic view of them as rigid and outmoded. And in more general terms, my concern about all these kinds of theorizations around, for example, um, mobility is that rather than undermining binaries as they set out to do, they all too often set out merely inverting or reversing them like this. But it's important to say the aim is to challenge binary thinking, to challenge the distinction between self and other, property owner and everyone else. So just to remind you of the phrase, some of the phrases from the Simon and Boudreau quote, but mobility is resisting. It's about informality in particular as resistance, resisting colonial emplacement, moving, escaping colonial control, metaphorically or literally. Compared with the crushing weight of state domination to regularize, to normalize, to entrench spatial hierarchies. So in recent years, we find that there's um, a great interest in the um, idea of informality as mobility, or as Raoul Merot reports it, um, in the whole idea of the kinetic city, he describes as a fluid and dynamic city that's mobile and temporal, often as a strategy to defeat eviction, and which leaves no ruins, it's in constant motion, in flux. Other authors in a Latin American context writing about informality as mobility, um, for example, Paula Berenstein-Jacques in the Brazilian context talks about shelter not dwelling. In other words, informality as the provisional, as the transient, as the neither here nor there, and therefore the constantly moving, the constantly developing. Uh, other theorists talk about um, urban nomads, borrowing in particular from Deleuze and Guattari and applying their ideas to um, informality and the residents as nomads. Um, or Brichet Peixoto, uh, a lot of authors like Brichet Peixoto or um, Peixoto or um, Netzer al Sayed uh, are talking about informality as a model for cities everywhere. So they talk, for example, in this case about the new urban condition, the city as flux. And such Positions in a more general context of um, globalization studies or post-colonial studies have been described by Timothy Brennan, I think very tellingly, as seeing mobility as a state of virtue, which is ontologically superior to fixity or emplacement, and which should be the basis of political life. Now, political philosopher Elizabeth Pritchard has pointed out very tellingly, I've only got the one slide, I don't have time to develop this idea fully, it's a very rich and complex argument. But she points out that the emphasis on mobility that, if you like, the post-development critics are, um, are advancing is actually very similar to what based, or, or the basis of ideas about development in the first place. If you think about Rostow's classic uh, stages of development takeoff, he was talking about a rocket of development, movement, was inherent in Western ideas about development itself. So as Pritchard puts it, it's the repudiation of location, of locatedness, um, of closure and stasis, that characterize a particular enlightenment discourse of development. In a property context, for example, in 19th century Mexico, reforms were made to um, property system in family law to reduce family claims, essentially, to property in order to free up more property for um, supporting the development of a capitalist economy in Mexico. So that kind of idea of movement and mobility is actually inherent in the original, if you want to call it, Western um, thought about development. And as Pritchard points out, post-development or post-structuralist critics or, um, who employ this rhetoric of mobility are therefore echoing this enlightenment rhetoric. And you can see this in the arguments about titling. De Soto, for example, talks about unlocking capital tied up in informal set assets. He's interested in fungibility, in moving them around on the market. He's not interested in security of tenure for families. But despite this, his critics talk about titling as normalizing, as settling down, as imposing state domination, for example, in the form of property taxes that people don't want. That's an empirical issue. In Mexico, property taxes are charged well before um, titling happens. There's no causal relationship. And this, I think, is the, the emphasis on mobility is one of the things that, that founds the idea of alternative approaches to um, 
uh, formalizing uh, security of tenure or to increasing security of tenure that themselves depend on intermediate or provisional forms of tenure that are less rigid, that might depend more on local authorities, customary authorities, negotiation, and so on. In other words, they're more mobile. More broadly, um, Paynetel recommend short-term tenure options uh, for the poor, such as rental accommodation. The idea being that if you're locked into home ownership in the form of paying a mortgage, which actually is not what most informal homeowners have ever sought to do, but um, if you're locked into paying a mortgage that you can't afford, as in the subprime mortgage crisis in the West, then um, you're going to lose your home altogether. So the solution is short-term tenure options. What does short-term tenure mean in that case? It means mobility and movement, because if you're not there for a long time, you know in advance you're moving. The problem with this is that um, it's, again, diametrically opposite to what I find people in Mexico want. So, for example, to quote one interviewee, all my life as a child, we were always going around renting, investing in this rental slums or small flats and well it's hard so we thought about getting a little plot so as not to andar rodando that means to walk around rolling like a rolling stone you remember um, dylan's um, phrases on that by contrast an informal homeowner says now here i've found my peace and that's why it would make me very sad to sell or to move from here because i'm like a plant that's put down roots here they actually find more freedom more possibilities for mobility in the fixity that the theorists condemn uh, and anderson kellett i'm almost there um talk about informality having gained so much momentum my underlining that formalization appears to be no longer relevant for these inhabitants they're simply wrong Residents' views from Mexico, the property of titling. They give titles, give validity, validess to the house, so that the house has value. And that doesn't just mean monetary value. That means something more, a kind of moral value. To be legitimately the owner, it would be the most correct thing to do. To have the right or law, to have the law, to ne derecho. And if you want to sell it, there's a formal legalization, not just any legalization, but formal legalization. Being right, being proper, is what these arguments are going to. So, um, almost there, very nearly clear. Final couple of slides. As Davis points out, popular struggles concerning property often manifest a conflict between established conceptions of property and critical ideas. And I would hasten to um, point out that the critical ideas are not necessarily the ones that the popular, those participating in the popular struggles are holding or upholding. Because as Davis again goes on to say, the legal characterization of property coexists with a more naturalistic popular and absolute conception about property, which is what, in my experience, residents want. So to quote, in the end, James Holston's book about, in part about um, um, self-help housing and legalization, the law in Brazil, Holston points out that residents demanded full participation in the legal city and inclusion based in very Lockean terms on their appropriation of its very soil through auto construction. So rather than, whereas Holston talks about insurgent citizenship, in the context of some of the debates I've been talking about today, I might like to talk even about insurgent home ownership or everyday properties. Thank you and sorry for overrunning slightly.